I am not a urologist, but I work with a lot of urologists. I hang with a lot of urologists. And um, what I've learned is that urologists don't like to use stethoscopes. So, <laughs> in I fact, don't like to do rectal exam. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And I work at the free, the Rhode Island Free Clinic, and I'm referred um, every patient who needs a rectal exam. <laughs> it's true. So, um, but I'm going to go. I'm going to speak a little bit about men's health. Just this is more of a generic talk, so it's, I'm not quoting a lot of articles because there isn't a lot about men's health, frankly. Um, but why do men die earlier? And it's a it's a relative question. It's been an important question since the 70s. And these are my disclosures. I'm in a lot of as Mark uh, Sigmund calls me, I, I'm an AUA scut boy. I do a lot of guideline work for the AUA. And, um, but gender differences in mortality and life expectancy vary by country. But in most countries, almost all countries, men live shorter lives than women. In Russia, it's 13 years. In the US, it's six years. And you can see from this that the countries in which it's closest are those third world countries, India, Nigeria, where um, the lifespan is quite short. You don't see any places for dad. You see people looking for a place for mom. And, you know, What's behind this male-female gap ratio? And we all have our hypotheses that men engage in risky, healthy, unhealthy behaviors, that men smoke more um, and drink more, that men have more exposure to gun use, um, that men are employed in hazardous occupations, that men have a higher rate of lung cancer accidents, suicide, homicide, heart disease, and the truth is that incarceration is mostly a male phenomenon in this country, and it increases the risk of dying. Um, that the XY chromosome, um, the lack of a second X chromosome means that X-linked abnormalities among men and boys are not masked by a normal um, version that women are born with longer telomeres um, and better immune systems, and that um, perhaps higher levels of estrogen in women protect them from heart disease. That being bigger isn't always the best thing, that we have lower, a lower release of growth hormone, and that males um, aren't as mature, which I would uh, imagine that almost every woman in this room would concur with, and that um, smoking, eating, and drinking um, contribute to increased cardiovascular risk. That women are traditional caregivers, and that contributes to their longevity, and that the greater meta metabolic needs of men and greater muscle mass lower stem cell reserves, and that the high-risk occupations that we see are mostly experienced by men or held by men in this country. But most of all, that men lack social networks and isolation and are isolated and experience loneliness, and especially after college, that men, very few men, form book clubs or engage in regular activities and our peer groups and our friendships become shortened as we, as we live longer. This is uh, one thing, when I went to sign in yesterday, I noticed that there were three sheets signing as, as signups for the Triangle of Pain. 
And so I searched for the triangle of pain as a cause of premature death. Because when I did it twice, I thought that I wasn't going to survive. And then the searches led me to David Crawford, MD, arsonist arrested. So I decided I better stop searching at that point and just uh, accept that the triangle of pain may be one of those risk factors. But the 20th century surge of excess male mortality, um, this, this article, which I found interesting, um, looked at all the historical data of almost 2,000 births from 1800 to 1935 in 13 developed countries and tried to determine the development of, of the, the key principles related to excess female life expectancy. And what they found was that heart disease was the major con condition associated with excess male mortality even when you account for cigarette smoking. And, um, and for all the reasons that we described above. So after the 1880s, I don't know how many of you watch Yellowstone and are now watching 1883 where men are constantly shooting each other. But um, after, the ex after typhus and other diseases, infectious diseases, it's become cardiovascular disease is what seems to be the major cause of excess male mortality. And what can we do to help men live longer? Well, men are not engaged in seeking medical care, acute and preventative. And that was true in the Commonwealth study in 2000, and it's unchanged today. We developed a men's health center um, at Brown really to support prostate cancer at that time, initially. And now we're seeing men with erectile dysfunction and testosterone deficiency, all men who have obesity and ED and metabolic syndrome, and we've become a center of cardiometabolic excellence kind of what Dr. Garnick was suggesting needs to exist, but is not present at this time in primary care or in the cardiology space. And I would state to his suggestion that all of these men who are going to receive ADT, even for short courses, need a cardiology intervention. They need a baseline CT calcium study to look at the degree of subclinical coronary disease that they have. In 1990, the, um, the NIH developed the Office of Women's Research. And in 1994, the FDA developed the Office of Women's Health. And to be Honest, it's not that I, um, I, I think those were vital, but there is no such thing for men. And men continue to die earlier and continue to die premature deaths. So we need to modify these atherosclerotic risk factors. We need to modify the risk behaviors that we see in all our sons in their late 20s and early 30s. We need to screen and treat depression, which is rarely done with men. And we need to pay attention, as you heard yesterday, to family history. And we need to focus on diet, exercise, and weight control, prevention of diabetes mellitus. So let's just briefly look at the treatment of obesity and how this might be expanded into cardiometabolic health. And I think something that I touched on yesterday, which is the cardioprotective effect of oral PD-5 therapy. The prevalence of obesity in the US is staggering. We lead the world in obesity in industrialized countries with 
after the age of 40, it's almost 46%. And that doesn't even include the southern states, where it's almost 60%. 60% of adults have a BMI greater than 31. Now, what's associated with obesity? We all know this. Low LDL, high, low HDL, high LDL, hypertension. Something that was rarely mentioned is sleep apnea. And what I have learned is that all these men that I see have sleep apnea. They have thick necks and they don't sleep. They sleep less than five hours a night, which increases their mortality significantly and lowers their testosterone levels. And it's untreated. And they cannot tolerate CPAP, many of them. So with 5 to 10% of weight loss, you get tremendous benefits, tremendous benefits. And there's the psychological burden of this obesity. Most of these people are depressed and have anxiety and eating disorders. This is the pharmacologic options for weight management as, um, and as they exist today. Orlistat is sold as an over-the-counter known as Ali. How many people see this? This is um, to prevent fat absorption. It's associated with about an 8 to 9% weight loss. But, and now Trexone or Contrave is also associated with some weight loss. Lyra um, glutide is one of the GLP-1 agonists that we were talking about. This is Trulicity. And this is associated with a much greater weight loss and w is an, a daily injection. There are now weekly injections of this class of medication. This is the traditional weight loss medicine. This is the medicine that elevates blood pressure and increases the sympathomimetic nervous system and has negative cardiovascular effects. These are the first weight loss medicines in over 30 years that the FDA has approved for weight reduction that are cardiopositive, that, are, that do not do anything bad to our cardiovascular mortality. The trouble is all of these medicines are ridiculously expensive and are not yet covered by insurance. They increase the endogenous production of glucagon-like peptide hormone, and that promotes insulin secretion, decreases glucagon, and decreases appetite, and it slows gastric emptying, and it increases satiety. Patients lose weight, and that weight loss is independent of the ability to reduce <clears throat> glucose levels. So what we can do is you can see that most, these were the step trials that Dr. Moy had spoke about. This is with inter interventional behavioral therapy. You get weight loss a little over one year that exceeds bariatric surgery that exceeds the 15% seen with bariatric surgery. That's what's key. So um, what about men taking daily Tadalafil, low dose? This was a retrospective study, 16,000 Swedish men taking either PD-5s compared or um, compared to 1,994 men taking um, uh, alprostadil injection, injection, all with stable disease. The mean follow-up was six years. The deaths were 14% in the PD-5 group and 26% in the prostaglandin group. The groups were normalized with um, because you normally expect to be have sicker men in the injectable group, men with more severe coronary disease. 
These were normalized with a propensity analysis and in um, cardiovascular disease, mortality, MI, heart failure, angioplasty, all were reduced in the oral PD-5 group. The editorial that accompanied it said that PD-5s may improve survival and that frequent sex also improves survival, that deteriorating general health is associated with a decrease in sexual desire and activity, and therefore a high cumulative exposure to PD-5s may have identified a healthier um, control group. So in conclusion, following the surge of infectious disease, men continue to die earlier than females. The gain in survival is multifactorial based on genetics and behavioral factors. The principal reason for early death is CVD. Cardiovascular disease is modifiable. Obesity is the most modifiable risk factor. And we finally have some new future hopes for treatment of obesity in non-diabetics. And PD-5 therapy may offer cardioprotective effects to diminish cardiovascular disease. Thank you very much. <laughs>